Guten Morgen, euch alle und seid bei Christ zu die Kadima euch von Ekran. Und ein schönen Dank noch einmal zu unserer jüdischen Diva Karen Feldman für ihre fantastische Musik. Good morning, everyone. I'm Faye Burston, the cultural producer of the Kadima, Australia's home of Yiddish language and culture. Welcome to today's event, the fifth in this year's Matona series, our online, online lockdown sessions of Yiddishkeit. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the Kadima stands today with a Yiddish acknowledgement of country. Wir anerkennen die traditionelle Opitel von dem Land, wo wir treffen sich heint, das Bunwarang Volk von dem Kullen Volk, und wir geben auch Covid seine Eltern von der Mall, von heint und von der Zukunft. We are thrilled to welcome back our very special guest, Eddie Portnoy, live from New York City, where it is currently 8.30 on Saturday night. Eddie Portnoy is an expert on Jewish popular culture. He has a master's in Yiddish studies from Columbia University and a PhD in Jewish history from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. He is currently the academic advisor and director of exhibitions at the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. It is the author of the best-selling book, Bad Rabbi and Other Strange But True Stories from the Yiddish Press, published in 2017 by Stanford University Press, the subject of his talk with us here online last year during our second long lockdown. This fabulous book examines the life of marginalised people, the downwardly mobile Jews, based on stories published in the Yiddish newspapers of New York and, New York and Warsaw. In today's talk, Eddie will take us down another lesser known avenue of Yiddish history and culture, the life and times of the Modicat Yiddish Puppet Theatre, with a talk followed by Q&A. Please type your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom right, not the chat, and we'll get to them in order after the talk. Good morning, Eddie. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Good morning, uh, uh, to, good morning to all of you. Uh, uh, Arop, uh, Arop Unten, down under. <laughs> I don't know if people say That's that. <laughs> um, lovely to have you back. Although when we were chatting here this time last year, in fact, it was just over 12 months ago, it was about 14 months ago that you gave your talk here on Bad Rabbi with David Slukey. Um, no one would have imagined that here we would be a year later, all still in lockdown, still in the same situation. So welcome back. Um, how's life in New York? Has Thanks. Has it changed much um, in the last 12 months? Yeah, not really. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, as you said, I, you know, just a little over a year ago, I gave a talk while everyone was in lockdown and we all thought it would be over. And I thought I would actually be in Australia by now. Uh, unfortunately, I'm still in New York uh, where things are, you know, not that much different than they were a year ago. Uh, it's... Um, it's pretty depressing, uh, but uh, you know we're kind of trying to learn to live with it. It's uh, you know some people are better at it, better at it than others, uh, but you know it's it's you know we sort of learn to eat outside all the time if we're going to a restaurant. Uh, it's it's a little odd, but and every restaurant has built like a hut. Every restaurant has built a sukkah basically. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everyone eats in the sukkah every meal if you go out to eat. It's a bit the same here in Melbourne too. There's lots of outdoor dining areas, although we can't even use them at the moment. But um, at some point uh, in the next hour, we're going to be uh, given our new roadmap by um, by our Premier. So hopefully people don't leave our talk to go and listen to the press conference, but I'm sure they won't. I'm sure they'll be gripped by your talk and we're very excited for, for it. <laughs> so with that, I will hand over to Tara Feint. Please welcome. Eddie Portnoy, over okay. to you, Eddie. Thank, thanks, Faye. Um, and also thanks to Jonathan for uh, for arranging all the uh, all the, the technical aspects. Um, so as, uh, and I'm hoping you can see the, uh, the PowerPoint that I'm showing. Uh, if not, someone should scream. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, something called the Modicot Yiddish Puppet Theater. Uh, it existed from 1925 to 1923. I'm sorry, 1933, that would be a little, little difficult to go backwards in time. Um, and uh, it was really kind of a unique uh, phenomenon in Yiddish cultural life in the 1920s and early 1930s. Uh, it was part of a efflores efflorescence of, uh, of Yiddish culture during this time. Uh, you know, Yiddish newspapers, the press, uh, publishing, literature, theater, music, 
uh, there was a huge amount going on. And uh, this puppet theater was uh, just, you know, one small corner of it. And uh, it, since most people don't really know that much about it, uh, I thought I would uh, speak to you a bit about it. Now, uh, the theater was created by two artists, uh, uh, the two artists you see before you, Zuni Maud and Yossel Cutler. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about uh, the two of them and uh, give you a bit of information about them, because they're, they're also, in addition to have, having created this uh, unique Yiddish puppet theater, they themselves were very interesting characters in Yiddish cultural life. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Zuni Maud. And uh, this is a portrait of Zuni Maud that was drawn by Yossel Cutler uh, that was published in a book in 1929. Uh, Zuni Maud was born in uh, 1891 in a town or a shtetl called Vashlakov, which uh, was not far from Bialystok. Uh, he had a traditional uh, Jewish education. He you know, went to Cheder and uh, briefly Shiva, and he was um, actually very much steeped in traditional Jewish culture. Uh, in, however, in 1905, he followed his brother to New York. And um, I could just add that his last name, Maud, uh, is kind of an anglicization. The, the family name was actually Moyed uh, or Moed. It's like the sort of interim part of a, of a, of a holiday. Uh, you know, during the middle of Pesach, you say a good Moyed, or in the middle of Sukkot, you say a good Moyed. That's, that's what that last name is. Um, so he comes to New York in 1905 uh, with his older brother. And uh, like most immigrants to New York City at the time, he found work in sweatshops. He worked as a shakingle, as an errand boy. He um, worked as a cigar roller, all kinds of you know odd, small jobs. Uh, but one of the things that Zuni Ma always did uh, kind of as a hobby it was draw. He loved drawing. And uh, in fact, in, in a memoir he wrote, he mentioned that when he was in Cheder, uh, in Vashlakov, he um, was frequently beaten for, for drawing on, on, on the tables. Uh, it, you know, he would just take a piece of charcoal and, and draw. And it was uh, obviously something that was, you know, not looked kindly upon, uh, but it was something he loved to do. And, and he always did it. And uh, when he came to New York, he found he was able to avail himself um, at uh, local art schools uh, like the Art Students League and uh, the Ferrer School, which was an anarchist run art school, which offered uh, free classes uh, to to immigrants, uh, which were very popular. And so uh, he sort of honed his skill at drawing. And uh, just a few years after he um, uh, arrived in, in New York, he connected with a group of Yiddish poets uh, who were uh, known as the Junge, the young ones. And this included poets like Moshe Leib Halpern, uh, Mani Leib, uh, Halper Leivik, uh, you know, there, there are a number of them involved. And their very first publication uh, was called Die Jugend, and uh, Zuni Maud illustrated the, the cover of that. Uh, now, just a year after that, he uh, found himself working for uh, the sort of first successful and important humor magazine in New York, and that was called uh, 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 Der Kibitzer. It later changed its name to Der Groyser Kundis, and this is an example of, of his work on the cover of, uh, of one of their issues. Um, he uh, also uh, worked for uh, the Forverts, uh, which is the largest uh, Yiddish newspaper really in history. It was the, you know, had a circulation of, um, you know, it had a print run of about, at, at its peak of about 225,000 uh, and an actual circulation rate of probably upwards of eight, 900,000 readers per day uh, because one newspaper never had just one reader. People, you know, read the paper and then gave it to their neighbor or the person next to them at the sweatshop. Uh, so in uh, 1915, uh, Maud was hired by the Forverts and he created a, a humor page for them. In the United States, the, uh, uh, the Amer English language newspapers 
all had, or they had all developed uh, what were called uh, funny pages or the funnies. And these were um, pages in the paper uh, that, um, well, if you hear a siren, I'm sorry, I live in New York City. It's, there's always something going on here. Um, so the, uh, these English language newspapers in, in the United States all had funny pages and uh, the Yiddish papers often did things to that imitated that. And so Maud uh, created a funny page for, uh, for the forwards. It was called uh, Dos Stiefkind uh, or the stepchild. And it was full of uh, humorous stories, uh, satiric, uh, you know, takeoffs on the news, uh, funny poems, jokes, uh, and it always had a bunch of uh, cartoons uh, like the ones you see in front of uh, front of you, all of which were drawn by Zuni Maud. Uh, and this is just an example of of one of them. Uh, you know, it's Baruch uh, Hot Fifteen Toler was all a fair ton mit und dem itzik in your You know. Borch has $15, considering the current inflation, who should he pay first? And what you have is sort of a common Jewish immigrant, uh, you know, with a lineup of people of bills, you know, ranging from uh, the landlord to um, the butcher to a doctor, uh, you know, all of whom he's got to pay and he doesn't have the money. And this is sort of the nature of, you know, in, you know, in a very small capsule of what, uh, you know, Jewish immigrant life was like on, uh, on the Lower East Side. People, you know, made very little money and of course had a lot of bills to pay. And this, this you know, this very much reflects that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as I said, he, he drew many, many cartoons and one of, uh, Azunimod has uh, quite a large archive at Yivo where I work. And so obviously one of the advantages of getting to work at Yivo is I have access to a lot of these things. So this is an original uh, drawing uh, that Maud made that, that was a cartoon in the forwards. And it's a you know, man standing in the, in the subway. Uh, you could see someone else reading the forwards uh, in the subway. And it's, uh, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's kind of classic cartoon art um, but, you know, with a Yiddish inflection. Uh, he also did, I would say, probably hundreds and hundreds of cartoons for Der Größer Kundis. Der Größer Kundis was a magazine that ran from 1908 to um, 1927, uh, mostly as a weekly. And it was, you know, similar to the funny pages that I described. It was, a, you know, a usually 16 or 24 page magazine, depending on the year or the issue that uh, was full of satiric material, um, you know, funny stories, lots and lots of cartoons. And it was really, um, it's really an amazing home for uh, Yiddish cartoon art. And uh, Zuni Maud was central in, in helping to create that. And so, you know, this is just one example of a cartoon. Every, every, New Year's, they would create a, a cartoon that showed, you know, a baby representing the, the new year. In this case, it's 1922 coming in to replace the old year. And the, the old year has, um, you know, all kinds of tangles in his hair, um, you know, that are kind of the same problems that we that we still have today and to, nothing really changes. But, uh, it, you know, this is just an example of how you know, all of this was translated uh, and recreated in, in Yiddish for a Yiddish speaking audience. Uh, so in addition to working as a cartoonist, uh, Maud was in a way the, I would say the in-house artist for uh, the poets and writers connected to the Junge, uh, this kind of new uh, sort of romantic Yiddish literary movement. And he illustrated a lot of their books. And so this is just one example. Uh, this is a book by uh, Alf Mem Dillon uh, called Gele Blätter. And uh, Zuni, it's really beautifully illustrated, um, you know, from the calligra calligraphy to the, uh, to the illustrations themselves. Uh, it's really beautifully done. If you, um, I, I, actually, I think you may be able to download this from the Yiddish Book Center. Um, it's really, you know, a work, the book itself is a work of, work of art, and uh, you know, Zuni Maud was was really very much responsible for that. Um, he illustrated 
dozens and dozens of Yiddish books. Um, this is just, you know, one example. Um, this is a, 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 from a book called Maiselech by, Her, by Herman Gold. Uh, this is a fish in a, in shuch, a fish in a shoe. And, um, you know, Zuni, he was, he, he had a great sense of the absurd and a lot of the, the images he created for, uh, that illustrated uh, Yiddish books and Jewish stories um, reflect that sense uh, of the absurd. Uh, this is another example of this. He uh, also worked beginning in the, um, I'd say around 1923, 1924, began to do uh, illustrations and also write a bit for uh, the Morgan Freiheit, which was the Yiddish communist newspaper. And uh, this is uh, an example of an original illustration uh, that's in Yivo's archives that accompanied a story that he wrote um, that appeared in the Morgan Freiheit called Charlie Nachman Gate uh, And it's, um, you know, you could see the kind of modernist style, but Zuni always had this, like I said, sense of the absurd, you know, where this man's leg is a samovar, uh, which is a bit weird, but that's, that was, that's very much Zuni. Um, and here is um, from a book called Yiddish America, which came out in 1928, which is a really wonderful anthology of, of Yiddish literature from the period. Um, this is a woodcut of uh, the critic Borah Rivkin uh, that's just, you know, beautifully done. And really, as you see, this kind of very modernist, um, modernist style. Um, so I'm going to skip over to uh, speak about Yossel Cutler a bit. Um, this uh, you see in front of you is uh, a portrait of Yossel Cutler drawn by Zuni Maud. We started with a portrait of Zuni Maud drawn, drawn by Yossel Cutler. Um, and uh, so Yossel was born in 1895 in a shtetl called Troyanets, which is in what's now Ukraine. Uh, less is known about his childhood. Um, apparently he was, uh, his family was so poor that they uh, couldn't afford to send him to Cheder for more than, more than a year. And he, um, he was apprenticed uh, to a, um, like a tavern owner. It, it was, he, and, and he, sort of worked cleaning up as a kid in uh, in a tavern. And the story that was told was that he, um, he used to draw a lot. And uh, the, a customer in the tavern said, you know, this kid should really be sent to, uh, to an art school of some sort. Um, that it's not really clear if that happened or not. It was, it's unlikely, unlikely that it did, but, uh, uh, Cutler immigrated to the United States in, in 1911 and in fact worked as a sign painter and um, he painted signs all over the all over the Lower East Side uh, you know that was a fairly common thing uh, you know people didn't have their signs printed they, they had to be painted by hand and uh, Yussel Cutler was one of the people who did it um, I don't think he enjoyed it very much because it wasn't a terribly artistic endeavor, um, but he had somehow connected with uh, some young artists uh, and one artist in particular, whose name was Morris Pass, uh, got Yossel a job at a small resort called Moshe Nadir's farm. Now Moshe Nadir's farm was owned by Moshe Nader, who was a very well-known Yiddish satirist and writer. And uh, Nader had all kinds of um, sort of business ideas that, that he came up with. One of them was this uh, kind of summer resort that he called his farm. And uh, another was a cafe that he ran. Um, you know, I, it's not really clear how well those worked out, but uh, but people were attracted to him because he was so so well known uh, as as a writer and satirist, and so he was really a big draw for people coming to uh, uh, to stay at his farm. So Moshe, Nad, uh, I'm sorry, Yossel Cutler was given a, uh, given a job as a waiter uh, at the farm, and um, the 
most of the waiters were also young artists and writers uh, because those are the type of people who were attracted to this place. And um, what they used to do is they would write and then get together at night and recite their works. And sometimes Moshe Nader, who, you know, as I said, was already an important writer, uh, would come by and listen to them. And Yossel Cutler found this very appealing. He wasn't really a writer, but he wrote a really fascinating uh, story uh, called Die Falsche Weltgeschichte, or the, the False History of the World. And it's, in a way, kind of the first Yiddish science fiction story. It has to do with the, you know, planets falling and it's it's a really very unusual story and it's uh it was so unusual and so unique that Moshe Nadir took a liking to Yossel Cutler and his work and really took him under his wing and uh a few years later arranged to have uh this story published in uh in a small literary magazine and because Cutler was seen as Moshe Nader's protege. He was given entree into a literary, a Yiddish literary and cultural world that he hadn't had access to previously. And uh, it was, he was really fortunate in, in that regard. And so um, one of the one of the periodicals that uh, Moshe Nadir contributed to pretty frequently was Der Groiser Kundis, which I mentioned earlier, where Zoni Maud worked as a cartoonist. And so uh, in 1922, uh, Cutler was given uh, uh, a job there as a cartoonist. And this is just a, an example of his cartoon work. Uh, and this is a cartoon from 1923 that makes fun of the Forwarts, which, as I said, was the largest um, and most successful uh, Yiddish daily in the world. And um, this is uh, what you see before you is uh, someone who's called uh, the Forwartsmensch or the Forwartsman. It's a, it's, a, it's a character created to represent the forward who often wears a top hat on his head, but um, it's often uh, portrayed as uh, the Forwards building, which which was a ten story building that the Forwards built uh, on East Broadway for as their offices, and it was it was called the first Jewish skyscraper, and it had um, it still has it still exists. It's now condominiums, uh, very actually very expensive condominiums, uh, but it still has because it's a landmark building. Forwards written across the top in huge Yiddish letters, so it's kind of like the first Yiddish landmark, um, but for a lot of people, especially the writers who wanted to get published in the Forverts, uh, they didn't like the newspaper because they knew that they, the Forverts had a lot of money, um, but uh, they didn't pay their writers very much. And the writers sort of had to beg to get paid. Uh, so this sort of portrays the Forverts as, as, as their Faustelta Bettler, the, the, you know, the, uh, the disguised beggar, um, you know, who doesn't really need to beg. Uh, and that's how Cutler uh, Cutler portrayed him, and and you know, similar to Maud in a lot of ways, um, their you know their styles are different, but you see a very kind of modernist style. Um, Cutler also, um, like Maud, worked for the Morgan Freiheit, and by the mid twenties, they were both kind of very much connected to uh, the uh, you know the the Yiddish communists, uh, and they also produced a fair amount of. Um, what I guess you could call anti-religious imagery, and this is just one example uh, of uh, of this kind of this kind of cartoon. Um, this is uh, a uh, appeared in a magazine called Chometz Le Pesach, um, which is bread for Passover, uh, which obviously you're not supposed to eat. Um, and what this shows is a pushcart peddler um, on the Lower East Side selling things that are kosher for Pesach, and as you see, everything is kosher for, kosher for Pesach or kosher for Passover. Um, you know, Jews are kosher for Passover. Smoke is kosher for Passover. Um, Jesus is kosher for Passover. Um, bread and cake is kosher for Passover. You know, shadows are kosher for Passover. It's like a joke that everybody, everything under the sun has to be kosher for Passover. And if you observe Passover today, it's 
very similar. Um, you know, everything literally has to be kosher for Passover. And this is, you know, an earlier incarnation of that in 1934. He's making fun of, of that very same thing. So just like uh, Zuri Maud, Cutler also illustrated uh, a fair number of uh, Yiddish uh, literary works uh, and other books. Uh, this, for example, is the title page and illustration uh, that he created for Moshe Leib Halpern's book of poetry called uh, The Golden Apave or The Golden Peacock uh, that appeared in, in uh, 1932. And um, you know, I keep saying this, but this is, you know, very much Yiddish modernism. Uh, and I think that mo when, when most people think about Yiddish, they don't really think about modern, but uh, this was what was happening in the, in the twenties and thirties uh, in, in New York. Uh, and this is just another example. Um, I showed an illustration from Zuni Maud, by Zuni Maud uh, from this book, My Salach by Herman Gold. This is the, the cover illustration uh, that was done by Cutler, and it's just, it's great. It's like this amazing combination of, um, of sort of Jewish tradition and, um, and modern art. And it's, and, you know, everything in it from, you know, the sort of creation of this bizarre, almost cubist character, um, you know, who is traditionally Jewish, has payas wearing a hat, um, to the calligraphy is just, it's great. It's really, uh, the, you know, the talent is, is pretty amazing. Um, he also did a fair number of uh, magazine covers. This is a magazine called Der Hammer or The Hammer. It was um, a communist literary uh, and political magazine. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, you could see the, uh, you know, really kind of fantastic and unique work that was done by, um, by Yossel Cutler in, uh, in illustrating uh, the, the, you know, these books and these magazine covers, it's really, um, you know, it's really special. In uh, 1934, put out a book uh, called Muntergang, um, which doesn't really trans translate well into English. Uh, Muntergang kind of, it's a play on the, um, on the word Untergang, which means downfall. Um, by combining it with the word munter, which means kind of like good cheer. So it's like a cheerful downfall. Uh, and uh, the book is uh, full of Cutler's poems and stories and cartoons and illustrations of all kinds that are, you know, in a similar style. This is an illustration that accompanied uh, uh, what I would really call a science fiction story in Yiddish called uh, Der Gott von die Mikroben, or the or the uh, the God of the Microbes. Um, it's uh, it's a really I, I recommend this this book. You can definitely download from uh, the Yiddish Book Center, and it's really really a very unique, unusual uh, book uh, or Yiddish book that there's really nothing else like it. It's uh, it's it's very very unusual, uh, and just as an example of uh, Yosso Cutler's sense of humor, uh, this is this appears uh, in the book. It's his self portrait. Um, you know, obviously, most artists' self portrait is their faces in some regard. You know, Yosso decided that uh, he would show what he saw, and he saw his foot with a fly on it. Um, so, you know, as I said, Zuni Maud, Yossel Cutler, very unique and strange characters in Jewish life. Um, now, as I said, um, Yossel Cutler got a job in 1922 at Der Grosser Kundes, where Zuni Maud already worked as a cartoonist. And the two of them became fast friends. They, um, uh, shortly after meeting, they opened a small studio together on Union Square. Uh, which is sort of in the center of Manhattan. And uh, they uh, made and painted furniture and sold it. They sold, you know, pieces of art that they had created. Uh, they, you know, were also frequently getting hired uh, by theater troops and, um, you know, magazines and, and people who were publishing books to, to do their illustrations. And so this is uh, just one example. This is a theater uh, poster they did uh, for a play called uh, uh, Togen Nacht, um, which is um, 
uh, a play that was uh, created by uh, or written by uh, Shlomo Ansky. Uh, and uh, the image in the bottom left hand corner is signed Modicot. And Maud wrote in a memoir that uh, whenever something was signed Modicot, it meant that the two of them worked on it together, uh, which to be honest, is a little unusual in the artistic world because it's artists don't usually work together on things like this. They, you know, do it themselves. Uh, but the two of them often, you know, one of them did the illustration, uh, one of them did the the um, calligraphy, and this is sort of how they were able to work together. And they were a fantastic, uh, they were a fantastic team. Um, this is just another, you know, example of the kind of work they did. This was a uh, an ad that appeared in the Forwarts, uh for the Kishif Macharin, um, uh, and you could see this sort of illustration. You know, the sorceress. You could see this illustration of the sorceress on the left, uh, combined with with the photographs. Um, now, in in 1924, when this ad appeared, Maury Schwartz, who was the director of the Yiddish Art Theater in New York, that that uh, produced this uh, this play, had actually hired Maude and Cutler to um, to create a puppet scene for uh, for the play. Uh, at the time in New York, puppets had become a kind of craze. They were being used on Broadway. They were all kinds of small avant garde theaters were were putting on puppet shows. And so Maury Schwartz saw this and he wanted to include puppets in the play. And he asked Maude and Cutler to create uh, puppets for a particular scene. Uh, but he decided not to use them because he felt that they couldn't be seen very well from the house. So Maude and Cutler took their puppets home with them and the began to just goof around with them and, and do shtick. Um, they would take them to the literary cafes they frequented uh, and, you know, they would bring the puppets and, you know, do little bits and um, they would go to parties with their puppets. And at some point someone said, uh, you know, you guys should really create a Yiddish puppet theater. And they thought about it and decided, yes, that's something we could actually do. So um, uh, at the end of 1925, they rented a, a small loft on 12th Street uh, near 2nd Avenue. And just so you're aware, 2nd Avenue was kind of the uh, Yiddish Rialto. It was the uh, the Broadway of, of Yiddish theater. There were, I think, 10 or 12 Yiddish theaters within you know 10 blocks uh, on 2nd Avenue. And so they were sort of right around the corner from that. Uh, so they could take advantage of that, uh, you know, of, the, of being in the theater, the Yiddish theater district. So they uh, rented this small loft and uh, they uh, started this Yiddish theater out of this Yiddish puppet theater. And they, their first play was based on um, uh, the uh, sort of a traditional Purim spiel uh, that told, you know, the, the story of Purim. And uh, but it was Purim as if it was set on the Lower East Side. Um, uh, Achashverosh is a drunk who drinks Slivovitz plum brandy. Um, you know, there are Italian pushcart peddlers who walk through and, um, uh, you know, Yiddish theater people play a role. And it took the theater took off. People word got around and uh, notices began to appear in the press and people loved it. It was they were great performers. Uh, they all, they always had music connected to uh, their, their little plays. Uh, the plays all, you know, reflected aspects of Jewish immigrant life uh, in, in New York and elsewhere. And uh, by the, um, by the fall of uh, 1926, they were playing nine sold out shows a week. Uh, they, you know, had become incredibly popular. And so um, they uh, um, they began to write more plays and they began to tour a bit. And, uh, you know, what you see in front of you is just a, a program that's in Zuni Mod's archive that, that, um, uh, that shows a bit of, of, of what it's like or, you know, what it was like to get, you know, what you would get handed when you walked in. 
Um, and this is uh, this this photo is uh, one of the scenes from uh, uh, what they call their Achashvera spiel or their 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 Purim spiel. Uh, and this is um, a uh, a play from a play that Moshe Nadir wrote for them um, that has to do with uh, the angel Gabriel uh, getting involved in arguments with God. It's it's really it's a very clever little uh, clever little play. But you could see the you know how the puppets um, are you know really beautifully made um, you know very artistically done. And in fact, Modern Cutler hired a man for a brief period named Jack Tworkoff. Jeff, Jack Tworkoff was an artist, but he was an artist who had been trained as a puppet maker by an Italian puppet maker named Rima Buffano, who was uh, uh, who lived who was an Italian immigrant in New York, uh, but was also a, one of the most famous puppet makers. So uh, they hired this Jack Tworkoff and um, who helped them. Uh, really learn uh, and become skilled with uh, with puppet making. And uh, one of the really interesting things about modern Cutler's puppets is uh, they all had strings in the back that if you pulled uh, would would activate uh, little you know little things like um, you know uh, wiggling ears or uh, you know a nose that went up and down or fingers or or thumbs that moved around. They're really um, uh, you know, did some innovative work in, in puppetry at the time. Uh, this is uh, an image from uh, uh, their, their version of the Dybbuk. They, had, uh, they actually wrote multiple incarnations of the Dybbuk. This was what I mean by the Dybbuk is a parody of Ansky's Dybbuk. Uh, the first parody involved um, uh, Leah getting inhabited by a Dybbuk and having to be exercised, exercised by um, uh, three major directors of the local Yiddish theaters. Uh, there's another version where uh, uh, the editors of the top Yiddish newspapers are the rabbis who, uh, who try to exercise the Dybbuk. And um, uh, this is a uh, an image that that Maud drew of uh, of the rabbis, you know, pulling the dibuk out from uh, out out of Leah, uh, and prior to actually pulling out of a, a, a dibuk figure, uh, they pull out all kinds of other strange things like a herring, um, you know, a little newspaper, all kinds of uh, odd things. And so the plays themselves were like sort of comic parodies of the originals and. For that reason, they were very much beloved by by their audiences. Um, now, what you see in front of you here is a card that's in uh, Yivo's archives, a card for the Mojikot Spiel Club. When when Modern Cutler hired Jack Twerkoff uh, to work with them, they changed the name of Modikot, and incidentally, Modikot is their two names put together: Mod E Cut or Cutler. Um, so when they hired Jack Tworkoff, they felt that he needed to be included in the name. So they added Jack in the middle, Mod Jack Cot. Um, but it's the Mod Jack Spiel Club, and it's a club. And this is a very interesting thing happened uh, in late 1926. Uh, the the landlord of the loft they uh, they had rented didn't like them or their politics and wanted to throw them out of the space that he wanted to evict them. And so he took them to court and sued them based on the fact that uh, their, uh, the, the space that he had rented them was not zoned to be a theater. Uh, so Modern Cutler, instead of hiring a lawyer, they showed up in court with their puppets and they had their puppets plead their case for them. And the judge and all of the employees of the court loved this. They thought this was hysterical. And the judge told them, he said, listen, technically, your landlord is right. Uh, he, this is not zoned for a theater um, where people you know, pay to go see shows. But what you could do is you could create a club. And instead of selling tickets, you could sell memberships to a club. And that's what they did. And so that what you see in front of you is 
you know, one of the leftover membership cards that they sold in lieu of tickets. And one interesting thing, you know, this is all written about in the press, um, the judge who, um, who suggested they do this bought the first ticket. Uh, and he wasn't even Jewish, didn't know Yiddish. He just loved these guys and their, you know, and their crazy Yiddish puppets. Um, you know, so it's a really kind of odd, um, you know, odd thing in uh, in sort of the history of of, of uh, Yiddish puppetry. Uh, so in um, 1929, they um, decided to leave the United States and tour Europe, and they toured uh, England. Uh, Belgium, France, and uh, then they went to Poland. So this is an ad for one of their shows in um, in London, uh, and all of the stuff that they did was funny. Um, you know, Yidn hat rach mones af zich, er hat es beim es kosher verdient. Um, you know, I, the translation is, is, is on the left. Jews have pity on yourselves. You don't always get the chance to have a bit of joy in your lives and you come by it rightfully. Um, you know, no theater productions advertised like this. Um, you know, only Modica did this. Uh, you know, they were really kind of, you know, everything they did was, was, was funny. So they had a fair amount of success in, uh, in England, France and Belgium. As I said, after that, they went on to Poland, uh, where they were absolutely an enormous success. They uh, played 200 sold out shows uh, at the um, Warsaw uh, uh, Jewish Literary Union. Uh, and because they were connected with, um, with the Yiddish literary crowd in New York, they also were connected with the Yiddish literary circles in Warsaw. And so this is a photograph that was taken by Alter Katsizne, who's well-known photographer, but also a writer um, with you know, a number of the uh, uh, Yiddish writers of the day. There, the two of them are in the middle. All of the writing on the picture is Zuni mods. Um, in the middle, you have Zuni and Yossel, or it, it's a, Zuni says Ich, Zuni Nebech. Um, to the right of Yossel Kotler, you have Itzik Manger. Um, uh, to the left of Zuni Mod, you have Zusman Segalovich, uh, and then Yeshua Perla. Um, above Zusman Segalovich is Melech Ravich. Uh, Melech Ravich was the secretary of the um, Literatenverein or the, the Literary Union. And in fact, Modern Cutler stayed at uh, his house. And in a memoir of that time, he wrote that Modern Cutler were totally unreliable. They would never show up on time for anything if it would you know if they said they would be there on a wednesday at three they showed up on a on sunday at 10 in the morning they he's the only thing they showed up on time for was their shows because that that seemed to be the only thing they really were were serious about uh and uh Milik ravich is of course the father of yossel bergner uh who lived in australia uh there's always an australian connection uh i Assume you know that by now. Um, but one interesting thing that uh, that Melech Ravage wrote about modern Cutler, uh, and I'm just going to read it just a, a, a brief couple of sentences uh, about how they how well they work together. And he wrote as follows: Truly, if there was anyone who ever doubted that su- that a pair is prearranged in heaven, he should take a look at Zuni Maud and Yossel Cutler. Such an artistic duo, each complementing the other so wonderfully, is truly a rarity in this world. Maud is short. Cutler is tall. Maud has a deep bass, a murky, dark bass. Cutler has a bright, cheeky, boyish tenor. Maud is full of Jewish folkloric tradition. Cutler is an expressionist. But when they're together, there's no contrast whatsoever. Um, So it's... um, uh, you know they were they were very much beloved. They did amazing, um, uh, you know, amazing performances in Warsaw. Uh, you know, as I said, two hundred sold out shows in Vilna. They uh, where they went after uh, Warsaw. They um, played uh, seventy five sold out shows in a row. Uh, at their last show, um, uh, Zalman Raisin, uh, who was 
you know, one of the leading figures in Yiddish culture in Vilna, uh, mounted the stage and asked them to stay longer in Vilna. The audience pleaded with them to stay longer, but they went on to play more shows in the provinces. Um, one interesting thing is that in Vilna, after they left, um, a local Yiddish puppet theater was created called Maidim uh, that performed throughout the 30s in, uh, in Vilna. Uh, now, in, uh, they went back to New York after their, uh, after their tour of Poland, uh, which ended in the spring of 1930. They worked in, uh, in New York on their theater material. Maud's sister, who's in the middle of this photo you see here, um, she and Maud's, I'm sorry, this is his sister-in-law, not his sister. Um, his sister-in-law and his brother ran a resort in the Catskills called Maud Zumarai, or Maud's Summer Ray, as they called it in English. And it was a very, it was a popular summer resort with um, uh, sort of left-wing literary figures and political figures uh, and sort of fellow travelers. And so that is actually how, in a lot of ways, the Zuni Maud was able to remain a kind of bohemian artist uh, because he was able to rely on uh, the summer resort for funding. And he and Cutler would go there every summer and, and um, they would perform with the puppets. They would teach puppetry classes. They would teach art classes. Uh, and they were, um, you know, much beloved by, by the, the, the clientele at the place. So in uh, 1932, Modern Cutler uh, toured the Soviet Union. And at that time, uh, they had to be invited. They were invited to tour the Soviet Union. And they understood that in order to do so, their shows would have to become much more politicized. And so what you see in front of you is uh, the set of puppets or a number of the puppets they took with them to um, uh, the Soviet Union. So you can see on the left, well, you also Cutler's holding uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, he's also uh, holding uh, British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald. Uh, Bessie Maud in the middle is holding Leon Bloom and a character who's just a businessman. And Zunni Maud is holding uh, US President Herbert Hoover. Uh, and the Hoover puppet, if you, um, Herbert Hoover uh, was best known for having uh, created Hoovervilles, which were sort of like giant tent cities of homeless people. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the lots of homeless people were, were going around cities selling apples. So if you turned the puppet's head, the other side of the head is a rotten apple. Uh, so, you know, they, this is something they were always including these kind of these sort of interesting aspects, within, you know, within their, their art and their, and their puppets as well. So, they with these sort of this sort of newly politicized material, they go to the Soviet Union and uh, they are very well received there. The um, you know as they had in Warsaw, they connected with the sort of Soviet Yiddish literary establishment. This is who they hung out with, and uh, in fact, they were asked to stay in the Soviet Union or really remain in the Soviet Union as heads of a, a new Yiddish puppet. Organization, puppet organization. Um, and they did, in fact, stay for about six months, but uh, no shows were organized for them. And they really seemed to get bored and they decided to go back to New York. And in New York, the following year, for whatever reason, it's really unknown why they got in, uh, into some sort of dispute. Uh, and um, they split up their act, uh, which was really quite a tragedy for um, for the uh, for the Yiddish cultural world because people really really did uh, love them. Uh, so I quickly want to um, play a uh, an example of one of the shows that. Um, that Maud wrote, it, uh, and this is a parody uh, song that was part of the show called Ich bin bei mir der Bossen Shop. Uh, and it's a parody of the song Ich bin a border by mein vibe, uh, which means I'm a border at my wife's house, um, meaning I'm not a permanent resident. I don't really live in my wife's house. I'm just sort of renting a room. Uh, 
And but this in mods version is Ich bin bei mir der Boston shop. Um, you could see the the translation in front of you, uh, but this is an opportunity. You can actually hear Zuni Mod singing it, which, um, you know, as I said, getting to work at Evo has its perks. Uh, so yeah. this is it. Bin der Boss bei mir in Shop, Shop, Shop. The Arbeit muss leben, Hori, Job, Job, Job. Ich hab feint in mitten drinnen, as mir singt bei die Maschinen, hier bin. Der Boss bei mir in Schab, Schab, Schab. Kommt dann ab der Reiter, der Linker und der Reiter. Ob ihr von dem Trubbel und der Neck, Neck, Neck. Ich hab fein die Sachen, Streit bei mir gemacht. Hab ich und ich schick ihn bald da weg, weg, weg. Weil ich bin der Boss bei mir in Schab, Schab, Schab. The yard that was leaving hurry, yop, yop, yop. Ich hab feint in mitten drinnen, as wir sind bei die Maschinen. Ich bin der Boss bei mir in Schab, Schab, Schab. So um, that song would have had, um, you know, a puppet businessman singing you know, as other puppets worked at sewing machines, that's, that's, that was, that's sort of the scene. Um, so uh, another thing that Maud and Cutler did uh, as part of their work together uh, was they painted enormous murals on the walls of the Maud family's summer resort. And uh, this is an example um, of them sitting in the dining hall under a mural that they painted. Uh, the, this, these tables would be cleared away after dinner. And it, it, this was actually the bandstand. So the band would, would stand in front of this. And this was sort of meant to, uh, you know, decorate uh, the wall behind the band. Um, and the, uh, you know, the murals included this. This was actually something like 10 feet tall. And this is, you know, really modern Cutler's sense of humor again. This is, you know, a, a, you know, a rich man getting serviced, you know, cigars being shoved in his mouth. He's, has, he's having, you know, rouge painted on his face. You know, someone's on top of him drilling his head, getting rid of his headache. And of course, someone is behind him, giving him an enema. Um, and, you know, this is just some of the work that, that, that they did. And one of the reasons that, you know, they were so irreverent. Um, and it's one of the reasons that people really liked them so much. Now, um, these are three, most obviously all the photographs you've seen are in black and white, um, but Yivo has three of Yossel Cutler's puppets uh, and they include uh, uh, two Jewish characters and a Cossack. Uh, and this is what they look like in color. Unfortunately, they're, um, they're a little bit worse for wear, but this is, they're really, you know, amazingly done. And I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, all of their puppets had these kind of innovations where if you pull a string that's hidden in the back, um, you know, something would move. So the puppet on the left, if you pull the string in the back, his nose flops up and down. And, um, and there's another one for his, uh, his thumb to move back and forth. Uh, and it's really just kind of very clever work uh, and really, really, really wonderful to see. Uh, now, one last thing I'll, I'll show you is um, uh, this is an image from Yossel Cutler's book, Muntergang, and it uh, is just listed as an oil painting, and it, it says at the top, uh, you know, I remember this from the shtetl uh, uh, in the marketplace, and it's an oil painting, and obviously the black and white re reproduction isn't particularly good. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty murky. It's also very, you know, you're seeing it on a screen, um, in real life, it's, it's actually quite small. Uh, it's just about three by four inches. Uh, and, um, you know, when I first started doing work on Yossel Cutler and Zodi Maud, you know, I first came across Yossel Cutler's book 25 years ago. And I always looked at this, you know, this oil painting and I thought, you know, I would really love to see the original. And, you know, as I mentioned, Zuni Maud has an, a pretty large archive at Evo. It's, it's got, you know, lots of his writings and probably, you know, about a thousand pieces of art. Um, Yossel Cutler actually has very little. And, 
He also cutly, Cutler doesn't have an archive because in 1935, he was killed in a car accident. And uh, it was incredibly tragic. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, Zuni, who had been in a fight with him, was absolutely devastated. Uh, it was a tragedy for the Yiddish cultural world. It was especially for the, a tragedy for the Yiddish left, uh, in part because many people said that Yossel Cutler and Zuni Maud were the only people on the left who were actually funny. Um, you know, most people on the far left were so dogmatic that they they lacked a sense of humor. Uh, but Maud and Cutler weren't, and they were hysterical, and people loved them because of it. So um, when Cutler died in the car crash in 1935, uh, the story was that his girlfriend took all his art and no one really knows what happened to it. Um, you know, certainly there were things that he submitted to newspapers uh, who kept the art. He gave a lot of, you know, some things to friends and family. Um, so some things did survive. Um, but, you know, in the 25 years I worked on Modi Card and, and Cutler and Maud, I never came across a painting of this until about two years ago, when I got an email uh, with this image attached. And I was totally blown away. I, you know, obviously the difference between this and this is pretty significant. And so what had happened was a, uh, an art collector uh, had purchased this at auction. He Googled the name Yossel Cutler and my name came up as having written on him. And so he emailed me saying that he had bought this at auction. And, um, you know, I was thrilled to see it. And the man who who um, who bought it, his name is Robin Lissick. He's from Montreal. Uh, he, you know, I spoke to him on the phone for many hours about Yosso Cutler, telling him his whole, his whole story. And he was so thrilled that about six months after we spoke, he showed up at Evo and gave us the painting. So it now hangs in my office uh, at Evo, and eventually we're going to exhibit it with, um, you know, more of the more of the same stuff. Um, so that is, oops, I don't know how much time I have. Maybe Faye, you could let me know. I don't know if I have to stop now. Um, um we don't have to, but we do have a couple of questions. So if you okay, if you, did you want to show the movie or you know what? Let, uh, let me let me show. I have a short film that Yossel Cutler made in 1934, okay. uh, and it's just you get to see him, you get to hear him. Uh, it's it's really kind of nice. I'll just show about five minutes of it, and then we can get to questions. Okay, great. All right, so let's do that. Was ich dort gelernt habe, dass mein kleiner Teil von der ersten jüdischen Marinettlichen der Guru wird. Die nehmen einen gewaltigen. Wo ist das Reden der Wort? Die nehmen einen gewaltigen Mann, der in der Masse der Jahre. Das ist das Reden der Wort. Die haben wirklich eine Idee. Die haben sie über ein Land, West, bis Hollywood, bis mein Westabschau, wer weiß. Was Schindler sind sie gringe, in kein Essen monoselig, in so eine ständig Gräbe. Ich wusste früher nicht gesucht, gar nicht, ich komme mir gehen. Wir sind der Kermann von der Marimette. Und ich hab dem größten Kurve mit dem gewaltigen Tal genügend auch vorzustellen. Kein anderer. Die Kämpfe mit seinen Niedern. Thank you.
und die Refsche gesehen, man nie den Erach. Nicht gesehen. Wenn man bedarf, sie sind nicht einmal ob sie nicht bedarf, ist sie ja gekommen. Schöne Pässe, wie wisst ihr, schöne Pässe. Schöne Pässe, wer an dir schöne Pässe? Ja. Das Borst ist ja doch den Kitchen. Ja, da muss ich kochen, wenn man blufft. Und noch schöne Pässe, die weiß, du bist gewinnt der Lettler. Oi, ja, Donner ist mir. Ja, Donner nicht, Donner nicht. Er hat mir gebracht, aber Tuna schabbelt. Wo? Ah, ist für du. Wo ist das? Das ist ein Sattus. Das ist eine Waffe, die heraus von der Brumm. Oi, sei es mir. Oi, oi, oi. Er hat eine Beike. Stay on, 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 stay Mm-hmm. Ja, so in mir haben sich beide verliebt. So, schämt sich nicht, ihr wollt wissen. Kein Stagefieber darf ihr nicht stuben. Ihr bin doch auf der Bühne auf dem Stage. Okay. Ich bin mir gesessen, also in Esterpark, im Gesingen ein Liedel. Die Liebe, die Liebe, die hat mir auf dem Gestampe weg. Ah, so ich ah, von der du hast. Ah, ah, das ist aber ein paar Liebte mir. Früher hat sich ein Liebte mein Stimme. Nur mit sich ein Liebte mein Euer, dem Euer. Nur mit dem Euer. Nur mit sich ein Liebte mein Nuss. Na, so ist es ein paar Liebte, ein paar Liebte, wie sich ein paar Liebte in alle meine kleinen Kriegen. Ich bin nicht doch da, ich bin mir doch Gott sei Dank in der Schule. I'm telling you, she's marvelous, honestly, she's marvelous. Schau, it comes to the same council. Schöne Pässe. Was haben Sie gesucht? Ah, gesucht. Okay. This is good. Ich bin ein bisschen schlechter, ich schöne Pässe. Ja. Ich habe gesagt, viele, die haben da drin. Also diese Seine, das Grad. Mäh. Ist noch ein bisschen. Ja. Ja. Gut. Ah, ah, ah. Oder wir haben noch nicht gerade, muss man das schon auf. Noch gerade, das ist noch mal weg. Ja. Ah, aber schon gerade. Ja. Ich kann das sagen, ich weiß nicht, wo es früher war zu unserem Ländler. Pferde rum, zu Pferde wand. Nur über so ein Dachmann tanzen. Ich hab mir gearbeitet, war schlechter verschieden. Ich gewinn als Sacharbeit und mir geholfen, mein Niedemeer. Ein Reiter, ein Reiter, ein Reiter, ein Reiter, ein Reiter, ein Reiter. Ich hab mir gearbeitet, nicht um ein kein Schlechter. Ich hab mir gearbeitet, nicht um ein kein Schlechter. Play 
Das ist voll hier los, ja, wird nicht um mich zu fressen. Bin der Gesellschaft, ja, gut, ja, So, you know, I wouldn't say that's the most professionally produced uh, piece of film, but it's, you know, all that exists. And it's amazing to see, um, you know, Cutler produced that uh, in order to take to California uh, in order, because he wanted to, one of the things he dreamed of was to produce a full length version of his version of the Dybbuk, of a puppet version of the Dybbuk. Um, and it was on the way to California that he was killed in the car crash. Uh, so it, it, it meets a tragic end, but it's uh, the fact that we even get to see him on film is, uh, is somewhat miraculous in and of itself. It's incredible. So I, yeah. Yeah. So I hope that was interesting. I'm happy to take any, any and all questions. What fabulous talk. Thank you so much. We've got quite a few questions. Um, Kate has asked whether there are any scripts of the plays that still exist. Oh yeah, there are. Um, there, are, for instance, uh, the script that Moshe and Nadia wrote for them uh, exists in his collected works. So that's available. It's just called Marionettenspiel. You know, it, they weren't actually marionettes, but that's often what they get called because they didn't seem to know any better. Um, and in Zunimod's archive, there are uh, dozens of scripts that both he and Cutler wrote, but a lot of them are not... Um, they're not all complete, um, but when they're the very first play they did, their their um, spiel or their Purim spiel, uh, was printed in a periodical called Unser Buch in New York in uh, 1927 or eight. Uh, so that so that that exists. So there are a few things that exist, and um, uh, there have been people. There's a uh, a puppet troupe called Great Small Works in uh that's based in new york that has uh performed some of these works so that's for me that's a bit amazing to see yeah so um we had an anonymous question that actually asked whether um some of this was still being performed today so that uh, yeah that's yeah. interesting. Us using the original scripts and yeah using some of the yeah, yeah using some of the original scripts in fact what what they what they actually this great small works uh created a uh a puppet show that sort of traces the life of modern Cutler and incorporates some of the plays that they did. So um, that actually, that would be a great thing to bring to Australia. Yeah, I can, can, I can hook you up, you know, with, <laughs> for the time, for when times are better. We look forward to it. Peter Wise has asked what happened to Maud and the uh, summer resort owner. All uh, right. So, so um, after Cutler's death, Maud continued to work, uh, you know, illustrating books, uh, working for the Morgan Freiheit newspaper, uh, but he never really attained uh, the kind of notoriety that he, or the celebrity that he had achieved with Cutler uh, together on either their artistic projects or the puppet theater. And he kind of just faded away. I mean, he, he died in 1956. Um, so about just about 20 years after Cutler died. Um, and he, uh, you know, he, he continued to work, but he just never really, um, you know, did anything uh, that, that, that achieved what, what he had done with together with Cutler. Interesting. Um, 
from another anonymous question is the portrayal of Jews, you know, in this work is quite stereotyped. Is there any criticism or backlash? No, in fact, um, you know, it from our perspective, it seems very stereotyped, stereotyped, but at this time, in this time and place, uh, ethnic stereotypes in cartoons and caricature were the norm. And uh, Yiddish cartoonists drew Jews um, in caricature. And that meant drawing them with, you know, scraggly beards, big noses, you know, in traditional clothing. Um, it like That's just how it was done. And because all of this is taking place in a Yiddish environment, uh, it's not perceived as anti-Jewish in any way whatsoever. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The reviews of their shows, whether the reviews are in New York or in Warsaw or in Vilna, um, all talk about how realistic the puppets look and sound and how you know authentically folkloric the whole event is. Uh, so it's it's, you know, it this is really kind of a uh, you know, our perspective, you know, in light of history uh, and in light of the fact that we don't live in, you know, a more closed, completely Yiddish environment. Um, and I think that makes that really makes a big difference when you when you look at these things. Um, in a similar vein, another um, another anonymous question was um, that, you know, obviously a lot of people were criticized that they you know if a lot of the work was parody and 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 sending people up was there any backlash from the people that were were parodied no and so so for the most part um people really enjoyed this kind of satire and parody uh and even the victims of it uh except for uh abraham khan who was the editor of the forverts so you know as i said modern culture worked as you know, political cartoonists for the their Groiser Kundis and for other uh, other magazines and newspapers as well, uh, uh, where they took, you know, Yiddish political and cultural figures to task, uh, you know, on a weekly basis, and I think the the general reaction was, um, you know, even though that you know, some of the cartoons and some of the performances were to a certain degree insulting, they were really done out of love. And um, to a certain degree, if people weren't criticized either in cartoons or on stage, they, they then they felt insulted. Um, you know, it was like, it was sort of an honor. Like you had reached a certain echelon of celebrity uh, in order to get criticized either in the press or on stage. And, and you know, if, you know, you were sort of left out if you, uh, if they didn't take you to task. <laughs> Funny. Um, Ellie Errors, it's possibly Elisa asking, I don't know if it's Ellie asking. Uh, there was a production of Between Two Worlds, the Dibbuk by an award winning adult puppet theatre company in New York back in 2004. Do you know whether this was inspired by Yossel's vision? You know, I don't. Um, this Between Two Worlds, um, you know, I, I actually don't, I don't even know about this. This is so interesting. Um, Tell me more. Oh, I like to thank Harry. <laughs> Ellie, you know um, okay, well, I'll wait for them to type something else. I mean, um, maybe they, I could say maybe they were influenced by him. I would, you know, I would, if they were doing a Yiddish puppet play, I would imagine they were since Cutler and Maud were really the only, they weren't the only ones doing it, but they were sort of the best known. And so I think that they, their work did have a lot of influence in that regard. Okay. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions. I think that's um, that's it. Um, Elisa, if you want to type in and ask more about that, but um, at this stage, there's no more questions. So, um, oh, hang on, here we go. Um, thank you, Ellie and Elisa. The production was apparently co-sponsored by the Yeshiva University Museum at the Center for Jewish History. The work was honored with the Unima USA Citation of Excellence in Puppetry an award established by Jim Henson and considered the nation's highest honor for adult puppet theater. So, wow, amazing. Thanks it's for that. A, a, a lacuna in my, uh, in, okay. in my uh, uh, studies. Uh, right. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look that up, thank you. Okay. Um, Charles Dallas has asked, was Dada and surrealism a big influence? 
Um, I think to a certain degree, I mean, you can see in their work, this sort of complete sense of the, of the absurd. Uh, and I, I, you know, they were connected to the art world and they were aware of, of Dada and, um, and I, th I think that they were definitely, um, you know, they were aware of surrealism and I, th I think it, it definitely influenced them. There's no question. Okay. Even, even in their, Go on. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, even in their stories, like there, some of modern Cutler stories are so deeply absurd. You can't, it, it, they, they almost create a kind of Yiddish literary surrealism there. It, 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 some of their stories are just so bizarre. Um, that uh, yeah, I think it's very clear that they were influenced by that. And you know, some of the calligraphy that you were showing earlier is just stunning. The, oh, the, yeah. uh, their work is just absolutely beautiful and was no doubt cutting edge at the time in terms of their um, artistic value. Um, anybody, um, oh, Ellie has actually, was Ellie, not Elisa, who posted that question about the theater and he's, he has, um, I'll put it in the chat, or I can send it to you later, Ellie. If you can, okay, send that's fine. Later, the link to um, to that puppet theatre. Okay, um, any more questions? Um, don't know if we've got any more. Um, I think that's it. Um, Eddie, thank you so much. A shine of dunk. Um, it was a really, really interesting. Lovely to have you back. We can't wait to have you here in person, and um, may you enjoy your freedoms sooner than we are and uh i hope to have you back again soon yeah yeah okay thank you all <laughs> <laughs>